life on the road It's just a little fears Don't let them bring your tears Hold me down or help me out But watch me turn to hell Tell me now what is it all worth my mic on oh yeah you can hear me um so honestly i don't really know what i want to go through in this project because it's gone through so many iterations that like and i feel like i've deleted most of this stuff but like i feel like there might still be some some old goodies in here somewhere um i mean i did everything on this song from super super simple stuff that you know everyone knows how to do but no one really applies to a lot more complicated stuff. So I'll try to touch on a little bit of everything right now. Um, one of the, ironically, most difficult parts of the song was this swell at the very beginning. It's a lot harder than you think to make to fake, I guess, an orchestral swell if you don't know anything about making orchestral music, like at all. Um, but the real, like, you know, simple fix was I started off with this. And it actually really just worked out because inside the patch, it has, like, you know, extra uh, oscillators that, like, fade in on an attack and I want to say if I play this all the way through it just like keeps getting bigger and bigger and I think I automated like one or two things in the plugin but they were already macros that were there on the preset where it was like you know make the the because it's basically it's like a filtered pluck and then strings right and so I changed, at the beginning, it's like the strings are super filtered, and all I really had to do was make the strings drag out a little bit longer and open up the filter, and it did its job. And then I just kept stacking stuff on top of it, even though I told you that you shouldn't layer your shit a bunch of times. There's a few situations where it works out. I've always wanted to use a spooky organ like that. And it worked out really great for me there. Um, actually, in the second verse too, the the chords are just that that organ, and it's it's great. I love it. I made a choice right from the wrong. I had to get away. It was no good. And that's like a really simple way to make the second chorus feel way different than the first, because in the first or sorry verse, in the first verse you don't hear that organ at all until that big swell. And it's just one part of a bunch of different things. And it was actually completely by accident that I put the MIDI for the verse on the organs for the second verse. And I was like, oh, that's sick. I'm just gonna do it. 
and it, it worked out really well. And then it was just like, I again, put in all the other, you know, accentuating synths, I guess, around the organ instead of the other way around. I don't even know what this one is. More strings. And then this is like some, I guess you could call it Foley stuff, like some sound effects to make it feel a little bit more or I, actually, I think this is just a vocal, and honestly, you probably don't hear it in the song at all, but it made me feel better that it was there. I guarantee you, you don't hear that at all. And then this is the one that's like a fully like metallic sweep. Um, and all that put together makes this cool, you know, this. <laughs> Um, pianos. I don't know about you guys. Pianos are probably my least favorite instrument to put in a song ever. This is like one of few songs that I have that actually has a piano in it because I can never get them to sound right. And honestly, I think I probably spent more time with these damn pianos than like anything in the entire song. Um, I want to AB for you just so that like, let's go to like, there's a lot of versions of this. Uh, new master play. Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, is there a wave of that? Of course there isn't. Why would there be? So let's make sure a uh, quick Ableton tip for you guys. If you're ever trying to reference other songs um, and you feel like no matter what you do, one song is, the other song is way louder than yours. It's because you're, what am I trying to say? You're sending the other song that's already mastered through your mastering chain. So you have to go in and click external out. And then that way, whatever song you're referencing is not going through your mastering chain and just getting sent straight to your headphones or your speakers. I didn't know that for a very, 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 very long time. And I was very confused. I could not figure it out. I swear, maybe it was like, you know, three years ago that I figured that shit out and it made me so frustrated that I didn't think about it before. So if you already knew that, I'm sorry that I'm going through the basics with you. If you didn't know that, don't feel bad because I didn't know it until like not that long ago. Um, okay, so pianos. These pianos on the old version are what I thought sounded good. And I knew I was wrong the first time I played it at a show. Just because I was like, cool, the pianos are super wide and bright, and I put this bass in it, and it felt super good in my headphones. But like, if I A, B this with the one that I did now, I haven't done this in a while, so hopefully I'm not wrong. But I have a feeling these ones are gonna sound way worse. I can say what you want. That sounds like a normal piano. That piano you like can't even hear, right? And like, there were two pianos layered. One was mono, one was wide. I was using all these plugins to try to make the piano sound good. Like, I would literally, you know, drag on all these things and like, piano bright preset, cool, sick, done. And like, honestly, at the end of the day, I just had the wrong piano sounds. And so I just spent a long time, I even downloaded new plugins, just trying to find the right piano sound for the song. And I want to say one of them is one of the originals. So I had that one. That one sounded really good. It's, uh, I want to say it's Alicia's, Alicia's Keys, yeah, which is probably like one of the most standard plug-in, you know, native instruments, piano, like everyone go to, right? And that one is kind of there for a body, which is weird because it's actually wider than the other sound. Um, and then this is the one that took me forever to find. And it just took one of my friends telling me again and again and again, just go get yourself the M1, which is like, if you don't know what an M1 is, it's a uh, hardware synthesizer that was super popular. And I believe that it, not the seven, maybe it was in the seventies, but definitely in the eighties. 
um, and it had like the every fire preset for because I mean you can tweak stuff, but like they were all like sounds on like chips, like cards that you would plug in to the hardware, and that's how you would get new sounds. So like you know like Thriller and like all these crazy songs from the 80s are so many of the sounds are from the M1. But specifically, it has incredible piano sounds. And it wasn't until I finally went and downloaded this that I found the one that I was happy with. And like, I barely EQ'd it at all. Um, this is actually kind of cool here. Um, this is, oh, what is this called? I can't even remember. Uh, I want to say it's under MIDI effects. Uh, random. Is it random? No, it's velocity, I want to say. Add some random, yeah. So when a real person plays a piano, they're not playing every note as loud as humanly possible. That would sound really weird and robotic like all the pianos in dance music do. Um, and I'm not honestly gonna sit, first off, I can't play the piano at all. I can't do it. I was taught it in school. I had it for a little bit and I lost it and it's gone forever and I have MIDI keyboards, but I like, I can't, I just, I can't, I can't and it's okay. Um, I'm not gonna sit there and go through every single one of those MIDI notes and tweak the velocity of every single one to make it feel real. I just don't have the time for that. Like I really don't, no one has the time for that. Some people will go in and do that and that's their shit and they love it. More power to you. There's a lot of stuff like that in producing that I don't do. You know, like I'm not a crazy like virtual riot level like mixing god or like serum god, you know, like I'll use presets and tweak them till they sound right. And like they won't sound anything like the preset that they were, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, like I like to do things lazy and simple. And this is a great way to do that. You put add some random, I, I changed these, like the compression and random parameters, whatever, and the out and high, whatever. <laughs> Couldn't tell you what they do at all. Which is, which is why I'm showing you this, because like, I'm not sitting up here trying to give some Harvard lecture. Like I am literally just like you guys. Like sometimes I don't know what shit does and I put it on and it works. I, I understand the general principle, right? It's every time MIDI notes come in, it is randomizing the velocity that they're coming in at. And just to quickly explain velocity, it's a value on each MIDI note between one I don't think zero exists because that would just be nothing. But one and 127, 127 being the loudest, strongest, whatever that that MIDI note could come in, and one being the quietest. So if you looked at like a real piano player playing, a lot of the notes would be very low velocity and then they would build up to high velocities depending on you know the emotion that they're trying to bring with each chord. Again, I don't have time for that shit. So I put this on and now every time a chord hits, it's gonna sound a little bit different, not noticeably, but like noticeably enough that it doesn't sound like I'm just stabbing piano chords at you. Um, whether it worked or not, I don't really know, but I hope so. To me, it doesn't, it feels a little bit better than when I take it off. Like let's, let's, let's give it a listen. Like some chords are louder than others, right? And like, to be fair, I could have probably dialed this in a lot more and made it so that it was like, not so cut and dry. Like some chords are way louder than others. Some chords are way quieter than others. But like, in the context of the whole song, it worked, I'm not gonna touch it, it's fine. Plus the song is already submitted and it's coming out on Friday. So there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and then I have this uh, bass line that is, I don't even know what this is. Come on. Oh, right, it's there. Um, some random native instruments thing. I just wanted a bass line that wasn't a piano. And I filtered it and filtered it and filtered it to make sure that the piano was the star and not the bass. Because the big problem in the one before, if you listen. I can say what you want. The bass is like way up here and the pianos are like over here. You know what I mean? So I needed to, K 
completely flip that. Um, and that's something that I've been teaching myself or reminding myself to do a lot recently is like, instead of just trying to make everything louder and saturate the crap out of everything, it's like, okay, this sound isn't the most important. So like, I'm going to cut frequencies out of it so that the sound that is most important is the one that, you know, sits in the mix. Um, I have that problem with hi-hats a lot because you want your hi-hats to be super high and shiny, but like in this song, the hi-hats are actually not as bright technically as the drop sounds because I wanted, when I had it like that, the drop felt super weak. And, you know, like a song of mine, like Feel the Volume, where the, the drop is like all low end or like, you know, low, mid, bass, whatever, like I, that wobble doesn't have much over like 800 hertz, you know, frequency wise. So like the hi-hats have all the room to play around in the vocal to be in the high end and, you know, steal the show. Um, but in this, it was like either the hi-hats were, you know, right in your face or the drop was. So it was an easy pick. So all I really did was, where the hell is it? I'll get there eventually. Drum bus, uh, cymbals, no, hats. I think it's in here. So I just did a really, really minor duck on a, if you, if you don't use this, it's FabFilter Pro Q3. The reason that I would suggest this over basically any other EQ on the entire planet right now is because um, let me just do this for you real quick. Uh, okay, that's not doing what I wanted to. Cool. Just kidding. I'll do it over here. So let's say at 898 hertz, whatever, I wanted to make a cut, right? And I drag that down. You see how that solid yellow line is going down with it? That is just like a cut. Like if you did it on Ableton's EQ8 or any other EQ ever, it's just like a normal cut. Now, if you notice, this yellow line is completely straight across the whole thing, but you can see there's like these little curves, you know? Like there's a little dip there that's in red, there's a big dip here that's in blue, a little one here that's green, and it's dynamically EQing. And what that means is if none of those frequencies that I've selected are playing, it's not gonna cut them out. But once the EQ sees those frequencies come in, it'll start EQing. So it's a really, really cool way to be able to cut out tons of horrible frequencies. Like a lot of my synths will start in like one octave, like lower and go higher or higher and then lower, like in this song. And so when it's in a higher register, there's a lot of frequencies that aren't as bad in the low end that because I was cutting them out on the lower version, the higher version feels thin. Um, there's a million different applications for it, but basically I don't want to have to cut out any frequencies if I don't have to, right? So dynamic EQing like this, like I'll, I'll, I'll play them and you can see the, the bands moving. See, it's like only bouncing when those frequencies are hitting. And like, I literally almost never EQ without doing that now. Cause like, Sometimes you take out a big chunk of a sound and it sounds like crap because you took those out. But like if you're only taking it out when that really like aggressive frequency like this, no one wants that, right? But like if I had just cut that out because of like, you see how like the blue like rolls out? It's not just like a straight cut on that one frequency and that's it. It's always gonna have a little bit of crossover. So even if you're like, the smallest, smallest portion you're trying to cut out, you're still gonna be cutting out other frequencies around it and those could be good frequencies, like the ones that you wanna hear. So then you always get into this battle, I would always get into it of like, well, do I cut out the bad ones or do I leave it because then the good ones are getting taken away and this is completely erase that. So I don't even have to worry about it anymore. I can just literally EQ as much as I want, go nuts and like, it's fine because like as long as that bad frequency isn't there already it's not going to it's not going to worry i wish i had a cool analogy for what it's doing but i don't um i'm just really excited about it cuz i started doing this like 3 months ago 4 months ago 
And this plugin's probably been out for way longer than that. And it just took me, you know, my stubborn ass this long to be like, oh, this is how you should do things. Wow. Uh, but it honestly, like, it's changed the way that I make music. So I figured you guys should know. Um, but yeah, so back to the original point, all I really did was like a tiny shelf, low shelf on the high end here. And that paired with these little cuts that I made, I realized that you can't see me pointing to my screen with my finger. I'll use the mouse. This one is obviously just like one bad frequency. This one is like some muddiness. And then this is like the real cut. Even though it's not that substantial, because it is high end information, it's easier to cut out a lot of it by just doing a little duck. Um, and that was all it took for like the hats to kind of sit back and let the drop really do its job. And the other thing is, because I had let the hats kind of shine in the old mixes, I was cutting out a lot of the high end from the synths. Because I was like, oh, this is too much high end information. If you have too much, people's ears are gonna bleed, whatever. So then once I made those cuts, I went back to the synths and like saturated the high end and was like, cool, like you're the star now, like take it. And now it sounds like something I'm happy with. I mean, if I play like, I feel like this one might've been by the time I already figured out the code or the, the secret sauce, but I'll, I'll let's do it. Yep, perfect example. Hats are brighter, synths are quieter, tucked down, and it's just like, it, to me, it didn't feel right. That, to me, and I could be wrong, you guys are hearing it way better than I am, felt like everything was in its place. You know what I mean? And like, I'm not looking at analysis charts. I'm not, you know, looking at, you know, graphs like, oh, my low end is here and my high end is here and like I have to balance, blah, blah, blah. It's not worth it. I literally just try to trust my ears and to be fair, it took me a long time. But like, once like I know it feels right, cause like every step of the way through this song, I knew that it wasn't right. And I knew I was getting closer and sometimes I was getting farther away but I always knew it wasn't there. And then the second that I finally found it, I was just like, okay, it's there and it's done. And then I sent it to Adam and it was a done deal. But like, I guess the point is like, mixing is a lot simpler than it needs to, or can be a lot simpler than people, especially like myself make it, you know? It's really at the end of the day, like just volume battling, you know? certain things being too loud, certain things being too quiet. Um, kick drums suck. I hate them. They're the entirety of all music and the only reason that people dance, but God damn it, do I hate them so much. I went through probably 45 kicks on this song before I finally settled with the original sound, sound that I had in the in original version. But I did a lot to the kick to make it feel right. So like right here is the original kick that, and by the way, wow, I missed a whole point here. And it's a pretty big one. This was one of the songs on, and some of you might know about this, some of you might not. Um, God, when was it? I think it was like the very beginning of this year, the very end of last year. Uh, I woke up one morning and my brand new MacBook with all the stuff on it that I just transferred from my old MacBook was dead. And because the way the new MacBooks are made, I couldn't salvage anything from the hard drive and I hadn't backed it up yet because I had literally done the PC to PC transfer like a couple days before. And I was like in the middle of like trying to get shit done. I was in the studio. I didn't really have my backup drives situated like I do in my studio now everything gone and this entire project was one of them. And all I had was a balance of the MP3. So I literally sat here and remade the entire song. And now I really wish I had that original idea because oh, it would be such a good payoff. Cause like, if you listen to the old one, the synth in it was like way detuned. 
Like it was like a full key away from where it was supposed to be. And like I couldn't hear it back then, but now I obviously hear it. Um, and like it was just everything was awful. So remaking it was actually the best way for me to salvage the song. Because like when I was working on it in the old project, I was like, you know, trying to add things here and there and it wasn't working out. And I couldn't figure out why it didn't feel right. And then losing the project and having to remake it was actually like the best thing that happened to me for this song's sake, I think. Uh, but anyways, now to the shitty kick drum. For some songs that would work, for this one, it sounded horrible, like so bad. And like with all the songs I'm making nowadays, like I'm trying to find this balance between having a kick that punches through the mix, but isn't also so high endy that like you get that like really crazy like big room click, you know, like you listen to a trance song or something and it's like, especially like you're on a phone or something, you just hear click, 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 click. I personally for my music hate that. There's people I know whose music I love, like IO, for example, one of my best friends. He uses trance kicks all day. All you hear is a click. Like, it's obnoxious. But it works super well for his music, you know? Um, so I guess it's about figuring out what kind of kick you need for your situation. And also, I think what I've learned about this song or about making music from this song that you guys should know is you have to build your song around your kick, not the other way around. Trying to fit a new kick into an old song is like next to impossible, which is why I took the old kick and did a bunch of crazy shit to it to make it sound good. And like no other sample would work. And I don't understand why. And maybe I'm just crazy, but also maybe I'm right. I have no idea. But again, I'm just talking from my experience. So again, this is the old one. This is the new one. And there's a lot of things that happened here. So I clipped the sample and I threw it into, a uh, what is this called? Instrument rack in Ableton. And um, I went in like this on an EQ8 and I figured out where the actual fundamental frequency of the kick was. And in, you know, the early days of Jaws, I never cared about tuning my kicks. I thought it was so stupid and pointless. But like, it's a huge deal. And you should definitely do it. Learn from the new me and don't listen to the old me. Because like, I listen to my old songs and I can hear it now, the difference between tuning your kick and taking the time or just throwing something in there. And it like makes me want to throw up. Honestly, I hate it. Um, so yeah, this was uh, four semitones too high. And the song's in the key of F. So what is that? F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B flat? That's a weird key for a kick, but that's what it was in. A lot of kicks, to be fair, actually are made in A. Um, so I guess A sharp is in a far stretch from that. A lot of music is written in A. So a lot of kicks are... Normally, you know, unless they're real, even even real kicks are tuned. I would say the most common are probably A, C, and E, maybe, because a lot of rock music is in the key of E. A lot of music in general is in the key of E. So first, I tuned it down to F, but then it sounded flabby and kind of crappy, because, I mean, you just took a sample of a beautiful kick drum, even though it really wasn't a beautiful kick drum, which makes it even worse, and you are degrading the quality by turning it down. Like, you know, this is something we can only do on an electric f electronic format. If I was tuning down the actual kick drum, it sounds a lot better because it's still a real thing. But this is like frozen audio forever. So like there's no way to just tune it down four semitones and it just sound just as good. It almost never happens. Um, one thing that helped, as stupid as it sounds, is I put this filter here, rolling off all the like really, really low end, because obviously you're gonna have your sub bass in there. But I put a little bump right around F0 on the kick, even though that's where all the sub bass is gonna be hitting. But the way that I side chain is that I make sure that all of my low end is taken out when the kick hits. And because if you listen to this song, and this isn't something I do normally, which is probably one of the problems, 
because normally I have really tiny kicks and my side chain is super fast. So like your the the kick is just kind of there for like the punch and then like the sub bass and everything carries the rest of the track, right? But if you listen to the drop, if I can find it without anything, and again, this is a feeling thing because like technically I should have just made the side chain super short and used a tight kick and it would have sounded good, but it didn't feel right. Like the energy wasn't there. Like having that like huge, like bouncing side chain is literally what gives the song all of its life. So like I'll play it with the side chain and then I'll turn it off and you can kind of see. It doesn't sound like that. That was Ableton going a little crazy. Let me see if I can, oh boy. I can't really turn it up much more than that. See, I told everyone that my CPU wasn't gonna be a problem and now it's being a problem. I did this to myself. Here, let me see if I can do this real quick. Oh, it's all already frozen. That's great. Well. See, I learn something new every day. Yeah, well, it's because we're doing the screen capture and all this stuff, so the computer's running a little bit harder than normal. Uh, I'm just going to play it again after I gave it a, bre a break, because the whole song played fine. It was just freaking out for a second, so. There you go. There's huge gaps in there where there's nothing happening, right? And... I had a really small kick on the song before because, again, that's how I normally work. And uh, that, it just sounded so stupid. There was like this tiny little kick with no low end and then nothing. And then like this crazy wave of like bass and sub and everything. Um, so I realized it was like the first time in a while that I had to actually use a kick that had some real low end punch to it and like dial it in so that like the second that the kick ends is when the sub and everything comes back in. Um, and it, it wasn't easy, but just to prove the point, here's it with no side chain at all. Or is this one like a quicker side? No, it's the same thing. Original, uh, I mean like the idea is still there, the notes are all the same and whatever, but like it, it, it would sound really weird if the song was just like that, you know? Some songs, like, you want it to be super straight on and you want, like, the kick to be tiny and it's like the, the groove and the rhythm is already in the drop that you wrote, so you don't need the side chain to carry it. But, like, this song, Feel the Volume, Rock the Party, a lot of those songs, the side chain is, like, what makes it have that groove. Without it, it would just sound, like, really weird and flabby. Um, so again, back to the kick, I was like, okay, I tuned it down. I can't cut out all the low end like I always do. So I boosted the low end to make the kick hit through harder. And while the sub isn't there, it's providing that low end that you, you know, want in a dance track. Uh, let's see what happens if I turn this off. Not a huge difference, but enough. Um, this is a uh, transient shaper by Neutron or uh, Isotope, I guess. And all it is is just a two band, basically envelope that every time the kick hits, it's gonna treat the high end and low end differently. So this is just making the, the click punch through a little bit more. And then here, I have the low end punching through more than it should be, but then also dragging down the sustain means that it's gonna end way before it would normally, if that makes sense. You can see it on this diagram. I wonder if it'll show what it looked, no. It's hard, you can't see it visually, which would have been nice, but it's like I sat there for a while dialing that in. Again, not necessarily as a mix thing, but it's more a feel thing. Like I could have probably brought up like a, 
I don't know what they're called, like an oscilloscope or whatever it is, where like you can see the kick and all the other frequencies and like see exactly how long the kick should be and blah, 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 blah. But I just kind of sat there and tweaked with knobs until it felt right. And that's all you can really do. Um, my whole point of, of telling you guys all this stuff is that I'm trying to explain that I don't know everything and I actually don't really know anything. So again, if I can figure it all out, it's all like, I had a lot of people help me, I went to music school, whatever. None of that really means anything. Like if I hadn't worked as long as I had to be able to understand stuff in my own way, enough to be able to create songs that like translate to other people, like all of the information that I have or don't have would be meaningless. So knowing what you know right now, as long as you work super hard, you probably can make it to where I am with, you know, almost no doubt in my mind. Um, what else would be cool? Oh yeah. Okay. So into a little bit more craziness is the synth for the drops, which is literally like it's layered. Sure. But like, it's really just this guy. There's this below it. But that's just like to to support the main sound. And if you look, I, uh, well, there's only this one that's like physically or like showing right now that I'm cutting out the mids from it. But like, if you just listen to it, it's like all either low end and high end. There's like no mid in there at all. And that's because I wanted all of the power of the synth to come from the the top and this is just to add like a little bit of the high end like buzz and sheen which is really important to know um i actually learned this by listening to a joyride song uh because when i was writing alpha which is like one of my you know relatively well-known songs one of my personal favorites i was doing this kind of similar sounding drop where it's like a high-end distorted signy kind of whatever and I had a bass supporting it, but I was rolling off all the high end of the bass and keeping all the mids. And then on the top thing, I was scooping out all the mids and leaving all the highs. And it sounded really dumb. And then I listened to, oh, what track did Johnny remix? He did a remix for someone, a Destructo or something. And he did a similar sounding thing, but his was like all the saw bass. And then like his, you know, the screechy bass sound whatever was like really quiet and i was like oh that's genius like you let the like lower sound actually have all the high end and then the higher sound you really focus on the mid-range because everything in mixing is mid-range like the low end is simple enough the high end is simple enough don't overcomplicate it too don't put too much shit in it and it'll sound good the mid-range is where everything lives and it's where everything gets complicated and that's where you have to start making decisions in my in my mind at least um so i i mean all this is frozen and if i unfreeze it it'll probably freak out and catch on fire so i'm not going to um actually yeah i am i totally am i'm doing it uh because i need you guys to hear what this song or the, what the sound sounded like before I did all of this nonsense. So this is what it sounds like right now, yeah? <laughs> sounds good, but it doesn't sound like really complicated. This is the original. Like that was what I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, and the original version of the song, like it didn't sound much better than that. Um, it's this crazy patch that I found in this thing called Bassmaster, which I love. This thing is like, if you've ever used Nexus before, uh, Nexus is like a preset only VST. It's probably not as commonly used in today's producers as it was when I was going to Icon, but it like, it is like the, it used to be the standard for dance music. Um, 
but the big caveat with it is that you weren't actually making sounds. They were all samples. It was a sample-based synth, uh, like a virus TI or something. So all you could really do is use cutoffs and modulators to change the sound that was already there. That's what this is, but only for bass sounds. There's some really crazy bass sounds in there. There's some really simple ones. And this is the one that really stuck out to me. Um, if you've heard the song I did with Zed's Dead called Shake that came out not that long ago, same sound, same exact sound. I've used this on like five or six different songs and just processed it in different ways each time. And like, I mean, I think I have some like weird little loops over here I can show you that are all this same song. Yeah, I made like five different versions of the Baby Shark Drop with this same sound, I think. Let's see if it plays. Same sound. Those two sound pretty similar, but it doesn't sound like this. And it doesn't sound like Shake. So you can use the same sound a bunch of times. Oh wait, you know what other song it's in? The one that I put out before Shake uh, with Axel Boy called uh, I Dare You. Same sound, processed differently. I literally used this one patch on like three different songs this year. And if I hadn't told you that, you probably couldn't tell unless you're smarter than I am, which to be fair, isn't that hard uh, to do. But uh, yeah, I mean, nothing I'm doing here is that crazy. Erosion, if you work on Ableton, is your best friend. Uh, it makes things that don't have high end have high end. Like, I mean, let's see if I can turn off all this stuff besides just the erosion. See, it's just giving it that like shh. And then you pair that with a saturator like Trash or a saturator in Ableton or whatever. And because there's only low end and high end information in it, it gives it this really awesome tone. Like I've tried to do this on much crazier sounds and it, you don't get the same effect because there's already so much frequency going on. You know what I mean? Um, so like if you have a really cool low endy sound that you've been trying to put into your song and you don't know how to make it fit, erosion and saturator and you're gonna find some, holy shit. I use this sound not only in this song, not only in Shake, not only in I Dare You, but also Thunder that came out with Denmo like two or three months ago. So like half the songs I put out this year use the same patch and you couldn't tell at all. I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm really lazy. Um, but it's also cool that you can use the same, I mean, it's like, an artist is always gonna use the same paintbrushes, you know, or whatever the saying is. Like, electronic music is the only place where we're consistently changing our palette, like, every two weeks. Um, and normally I do. Normally I don't like to use the same sound on more than one song. I just get sick of it. Um, I think the Feel the Volume sound I only used on one other song, and it was a remix, like, back in 2015. Um, but being able to take a same that same sound and transform it into a bunch of other stuff is really cool. Um, and that's where you can kind of start getting creative with stuff. So all this stuff is kind of boring. Erosion, if you use trash, cool. If you don't, there's other, you know, saturators that do the same thing. But if you do use trash, go into fuzz and use smooth, positive, or negative, all the other ones will absolutely destroy your sound forever. They, if you can figure out how to use like anything in like distort or drive or faulty, like you're my hero, because I cannot. Those are the only ones, and I, I didn't use this plugin for a long time because I couldn't figure out how to make it work. Um, Amp is one of my favorite plugins that Ableton makes makes everything sound crazy, but then you dial it back on the dry wet and it sounds real nice. Pair that with overdrive, and I'm basically not even using these as saturators. They're more like coloring tools as, as far as like coloring the timbre of a sound, if that makes sense. Like, I've gotten in the habit now, I'll throw overdrive on everything, hi-hats, kicks, whatever, 
and you just like dial back the drive and turn up the tone and dynamics or do whatever you have to do, bring the hot, um, eventually you bring the dry wet down, but you leave it at 100% and drag this little, this little guy here around until you find like the sweet spot of a sound, you know? And then dial down the dry wet until you can barely hear it, but it's completely changed the way the, so the sound sounds. The way the sound sounds. That's, that's tough to say. Um, and then uh, I used a tight reverb on this. Did I? Is it tight? So it's a little bit bigger than the reverb that I put on the entire group. I normally like to put like a really, really big, tight reverb like this. If you play it without. Again, I don't know if you can tell the difference out there at all. Um, but when I was making it in my studio, um, pretty much every song I make, I put a reverb like that um, on the entire group because it like, not even, as a reverb, but it like just kind of gels the whole drop together so that even if sounds are totally separate from each other, they still feel kind of like cohesive, if that makes sense. Um, there's just a couple EQs on the reverb there. And then me doing that same thing with the fab filter. Um, I even brought up the high end here. That's surprising. I guess it sounded good. I normally don't do that. Um, but yeah, most of the stuff here is just those crazy subtractive cuts that are only happening when those frequencies are actually playing in the sound. But like, if you have a sound with this much frequency going on, like this is like, it's sc literally screaming. You know what I mean? And like, I'm not even doing enough that you really hear a difference, but like it makes, it opens up a lot of pockets frequency wise for other stuff to fill in. And it's like, the more you do subtractive cuts like this, and I can't believe that I'm saying this stuff because I've watched so many YouTube videos. I've been in so many classes at Icon. I've had so many people who know more than me tell me, all you have to do to make yourself sound better is use a bunch of subtractive EQing on everything. And I always thought they were full of shit. And now here I am telling you guys to use a bunch of subtractive EQing to make all your stuff sound good. But like, I guess the big problem I had with it back in the day is I didn't know how to subtractive EQ properly. And so I was cutting out way too much stuff. I was cutting out way too much low end. I was cutting out like core fundamental frequencies of sounds, whatever. And honestly, I could go here and explain to you why I made all these cuts and whatever, but honestly, at the end of the day, you're not gonna figure it out until you figure it out for yourself. Because obviously, I got taught it a bunch of times and I didn't figure it out until like four months ago. And here we are. So just do it, you know? Get in the habit of EQing a lot and learning when you're ruining stuff and when you're not ruining stuff. And then when you're not ruining stuff, keep doing that. And when you are ruining stuff, stop doing that. It's really simple. Uh, it's super straightforward. Uh, but I think that's all I have to show you guys. Unless I know we're getting into like a Q and A right now. So if you guys have any like project specific questions, I guess I'll take those ones first. Guys, make some. Give me some volume. Make some noise for Jaws.